All right, time to go teach. Hello and welcome to this episode of Tutor Tutors where we are continuing our tour of the cell and we are looking at bioenergetics. The past few episodes we looked at the fact that the cell had to maintain homeostasis to stay alive. And now we're looking at a different characteristic of life. We're looking at the fact that the cell needs to use energy. So where does that energy come from and how is it able to use it? So today First thing is, we're going to define energy. What is it? How does it actually work? Next, we're going to compare and contrast the chloroplasts and the mitochondria. These are two different organelles that are going to be very important for how a cell is able to first off get its energy, and second off, how is it able to use that energy? And then we're actually going to look at those processes, specifically that the mitochondria and the chloroplast are going to use, photosynthesis and aerobic cellular respiration. So those are the goals for the day. Let's get started. Here we go. So first, the ability to do work, that is energy. And it comes in many forms. Mechanical is the energy of motion. So me just moving my arm is actually showing mechanical energy lifting this little remote. That would be mechanical energy, light being able to have the wavelengths of light so we, that we can see and other different wavelengths that actually are outside of our visible spectrum. Those are all energy. Chemical energy, that would be the energy that is stored within bonds of different molecules. You also have thermal energy, which is evident right here in a fire. And energy cannot be created or destroyed. And so when we have a fire, one thing that we can recognize is now a fire is emitting light. It is giving off illumination, so it is giving off light energy. And it's also giving off thermal energy, energy and heat, so it's warming us. But where did that energy come from? Well, if it's like this fire, which happens to be used from burning wood, the energy is actually coming from chemical energy. So the wood had energy stored within it in its chemical bonds. And when you burn it, you are releasing that energy out into the environment and it will be shown as light and heat. It's converted to those. Now cells, they use that chemical energy. And chemical energy is energy that is stored in the bonds of the molecules. And if a cell wants to store chemical energy, it wants to store that energy in very stable bonds. It doesn't want what it's stored to break down just randomly. That would be very bad for the cell. So that's why we use carbohydrates and lipids for our, our energy storage. Those are very stable molecules. Those bonds do not break down. They will last for an extremely long period of time unless they are acted upon when the cell wants to break them down. So they won't break down just on their own. The cell would have to actually do that for them. That's why they work really good as our energy storage molecule. But since they're so good at storage of energy, they actually end up not being very good at being an energy transfer molecule. They're not good for actually bringing the energy from one part of the cell to another part of the cell so that the cell can do whatever it needs to do, which could be active transport, which uses energy, or the cell growing, which would require energy, or responding to stimuli, which would require energy. For the cell to do any of those different processes, it needs the energy to be brought from one area to the area that it is required. So it needs what's called an energy transfer molecule. And the cells use a specific molecule called ATP, adenosine triphosphate. That is the molecule that cells will use to bring energy from one location to another location so that way it can be used. ATP is, in a sense, the usable energy. It is not the stored energy. It is the energy that the cell is going to use. And both of these, whether stored or energy transfer, are chemical energy. So looking at it specifically a little bit closer, adenosine triphosphate, that's how it gets its name with the A, T, and the P. And it brings energy from one location to another. That's why it's the energy transfer molecule. The energy that it's actually transferring is within that bond right there, the bond between the second and the third phosphate. That's where the energy is going to come from to power 
active transport or the cell growing or the cell responding to stimuli or making sure a chemical reaction takes place. Whatever it is that is requiring energy, that energy is right there in that bond. And so when that bond breaks, that energy is released. And that also means that we no longer would have ATP. We'd only have adenosine diphosphate. We would have two phosphates attached, and that's why we'd call it diphosphate, because di stands for two. And so this is ADP, and we'd have a phosphate group sitting on the side, just being released. The ADP and the phosphate can get joined back together again to form ATP, and thus they, these molecules can be recycled and used over and over and over and over again. The reason why we don't use it for an energy storage molecule is because it is very unstable. The bond between the second and the third phosphate would actually break down on its own. And that means we wouldn't be able to store it for very long periods of time. In fact, it would break down extremely rapidly. And that means that a lot of energy would be lost. And we do not want to have a lot of energy lost within us. Cells don't want to waste energy because if they do, that can mean the difference between life or death. ATP would just result in a lot of lost energy if it was used as an energy storage molecule. And that's why it's not used as an energy storage molecule and it's only used as an energy transfer molecule. So the organelles involved in getting us to that ATP is actually the chloroplast only found in plants, so here's our chloroplast, and the mitochondria, which is found in both plants and in animals. These organelles are going to help us get the energy that we require for life to exist. So the chloroplast, it's where photosynthesis is going to occur, which traps light energy and converts it to chemical energy. Because remember, Energy cannot be created or destroyed, so the energy that is in those cells had to come from somewhere. And where does it come from? Well, in this case, sunlight. And then it will store that chemical energy as glucose. Aerobic cellular respiration, which will take place with the mitochondria, that is going to take that glucose and we're going to break it down and we're going to just put together our ATP molecules we are going to fuse the phosphate to the ADP, putting them together to make ATP, so that we then have usable energy. That's the whole process. That's what we're trying to do. The chloroplast is specifically a plastid. That's a type of organelle that's only found in plants that either contains a pigment or food. The only one that we're gonna talk about is actually just this one. It is the most famous of all the plastids. It is called the chloroplast. And we call it that because it happens to have chlorophyll in it. Now, it has a double membrane. It has these membranous sacs that are basically stacked on top of each other. They're called the thylakoids. And that's where the chlorophyll is. And chlorophyll is going to be the pigment that allows chloroplast to actually perform photosynthesis. It is the the pigment that is going to actually capture that light energy originally. And then the stacks of our thylakoid, those are called granum singularly, and plural would be grana. And all the space that's in between all of our different grana, that is called the stroma. The stroma is a space that's outside of all of the different thylakoids. The mitochondrion, found in both animals and plants, well, it is a double membrane system as well. It also has a double membrane. Its double membrane is going to be really infolded, and that is called the cristae. And the purpose of that infolding is to increase the surface area so that you can have more of these chemical reactions taking place that are required for the cell to produce ATP. That's the reason for all that infolding, is to increase the surface area. Because we always got to keep it in our head. Surface area, that is necessary for the cell to exist. Volume is most of the time wasted space. So we don't want to have a lot of volume. We really want to have a lot of surface area. And that's the reason for this infolding. That's the reason for our cristae.
The matrix is within the inner membrane. And in this intermembranous space that we call the matrix, we are also going to have other biomolecular pathways to allow for the production of ATP. Overall, our chemical reactions, you should hopefully see that they look really similar. For the photosynthesis, it's six carbon dioxides plus six waters is going to yield one glucose molecule and six oxygen molecules. On the other hand, aerobic cellular respiration is going to take one glucose molecule and it is going to react with six oxygen molecules resulting in six carbon dioxides and six water molecules being produced. If we were to take these, and you should hopefully have seen that they were the exact opposites, means that the six carbon dioxides plus six H2Os, those would feed the chloroplast for photosynthesis and result in one glucose and six oxygens. And then those six oxygens and that one glucose will feed the mitochondria, resulting in the production of six CO2s and six H2Os. So we have this cycle between the mitochondria and the chloroplast. This can happen by itself within a plant cell, or it happens for us when we consume glucose and we breathe in oxygen to fuel our mitochondrion. We can't make the glucose on our own. We can't make the oxygen on our own. We have to bring in those materials for our mitochondria, whereas a plant would produce those materials for its mitochondria from its chloroplast, and what its mitochondria produces will feed the chloroplast. The plant cells are able to provide all of what is required for each of these organelles, but for us, we must consume it and we must breathe it in. So in summary of all this, cells, they require energy to function. That's just one of the characteristics of life. You need to remember that, and that's really crucial for all cells to exist. So photosynthesis, it's only going to occur in that chloroplast. In those plant cells, where it's going to convert light energy to chemical energy, building those glucose molecules. Aerobic cellular respiration, that's going to occur both in plant cells and in animal cells using the mitochondria, and it's going to take that energy that was stored from photosynthesis, and it is going to convert that energy. It's going to convert it into an energy transfer molecule called ATP because you are no longer trying to store it, you are now trying to use it. And the chemical reactions for photosynthesis and cellular respiration are exactly opposite of each other. They feed each other in a cyclical manner. And that's it for this time. Till next time, be awesome, stay awesome.